Section 19 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 18th May 1645. I intended to have seen Loretto, but being disappointed of monies long expected, I was forced to return by the same way I came, desiring, if possible, to be at Venice by the Ascension, and therefore I diverted to take Leghorn in the way, as well as to furnish me with credit by a merchant there as to take order for transporting such collections as I had made at Rome. When on my way, turning about to behold this once and yet glorious city from an eminence, I did not without some regret give it my last farewell. Having taken leave of our friends at Rome, where I had sojourned now about seven months, autumn, winter and spring, I took coach in company with two courteous Italian gentlemen. In the afternoon we arrived at a house, or rather castle, belonging to the Duke of Parma, called Caprarola, situate on the brow of a hill that overlooks a little town, or rather a natural and stupendous rock, witness those vast caves serving now for cellarage, where we were entertained with most generous wine of several sorts, being just under the foundation. The palace was built by the famous architect Vignola, at the cost of Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, in form of an octagon, the court in the middle being exactly round, so as rather to resemble a fort or castle. Yet the chambers within are all of them square, which makes the walls exceeding thick. One of these rooms is so artificially contrived, that from the two opposite angles may be heard the least whisper. They say any perfect square does it. Most of the paintings are by Zuccari. It has a stately entry on which spouts an artificial fountain within the porch. The hall, chapel and a great number of lodging chambers are remarkable but most of all the pictures and witty inventions of Hannibal Caracci. The dead Christ is incomparable. Behind are the gardens full of statues and noble fountains, especially that of the shepherds. After dinner we took horse and lay that night at Monte Rossi, twenty miles from Rome. 19th May 1645, we dined at Viterbo and lay at San Lorenzo, next day at Radicofani, and slept at Turnera. Siena. 21st May 1645. We dined at Siena, where we could not pass admiring the great church, built entirely both within and without, with white and black marble, in polished squares, by Macarino, showing so beautiful after a shower has fallen. The floor within is of various coloured marbles representing the story of both testaments, admirably wrought. Here lies Pius II. The Bibliotheca is painted by P. Perugino and Raphael. The life of Aeneas Silvius is in fresco. In the middle are the three graces in antique marble, very curious, and the front of this building, though gothic, is yet very fine. Among other things, they show St. Catherine's disciplining cell, the door whereof is half cut out into chips by the pilgrims and devotees, being of deal wood. Setting out hence for Pisa, we went again to see the Duomo in which the Emperor Henry the Seventh lies buried, poisoned by a monk in the Eucharist. The bending tower was built by Buschetto de Lecchio, a Grecian architect, and is a stupendous piece of art. In the gallery of curiosities is a fair mummy, the tail of a seahorse, coral growing on a man's skull, a chariot automaton, two pieces of rock crystal, in one of which is a drop of water, in the other three or four small worms, two embalmed children, diverse petrifactions, etc. The garden of simples is well furnished and has in it the deadly yew or taxus of the ancients, which Dr. Belluccio, the superintendent, affirms that his workmen cannot endure to clip for above the space of half an hour at a time from the pain of the head which surprises them. We went hence from Leghorn by coach, where I took up ninety crowns for the rest of my journey, with letters of credit for Venice after I had sufficiently complained of my defeat of correspondence at Rome. 
The next day I came to Luca, a small but pretty territory and state of itself. The city is neat and well fortified, with noble and pleasant walks of trees on the works, where the gentry and ladies used to take the air. It is situate on an ample plain by the river Circio, yet the country about it is hilly. The Senate house is magnificent. The church of St. Michael is a noble piece, as is also St. Fridian, more remarkable to us, for the corpse of St. Richard, an English king, who died here on his pilgrimage toward Rome. This epitaph is on his tomb. Hic rex Ricardus requiescit, sceptifer almus, rex fuit anglorum, regnum tenis iste polorum. Regnum demisit, pro Christo cuncta reclicuit, ergo Ricardum nobis debit Anglia sanctum, hic genitor sancti vulborgae virginis almae. Est vrilelbilaldi sancti simul et vine baldi, suffragium quorum nobis det regna polorum. Next this we visited San Croce, an excellent structure, all of marble, both without and within, and so adorned as may vie with many of the fairest even in Rome. Witness the huge cross, valued at fifteen thousand pounds, above all venerable for that sacred volto, which, as tradition goes, was miraculously put on the image of Christ, and made by Nicodemus, while the artist, finishing the rest of the body, was meditating what face to set on it. The inhabitants are exceedingly civil to strangers above all places in Italy, and they speak the purest Italian. It is also cheap living which causes travellers to set up their rest here more than in Florence, though a more celebrated city. Besides, the ladies here are very conversable, and the religious women not at all reserved. Of these we bought gloves and embroidered stomachers, generally worn by gentlemen in these countries. The circuit of this state is but two easy days' journey, and lies mixed with the Duke of Tuscany's, but having Spain for a protector, though the least bigoted of all Roman Catholics, and being one of the fortified cities in Italy, it remains in peace. The whole country abounds in excellent olives, etc. Pistoria Going hence for Florence, we dined at Pistoria, where besides one church there was little observable. Only in the highway we crossed a rivulet of salt water, though many miles from the sea. The country is extremely pleasant, full of gardens, and the road straight as a line for the best part of the whole day, the hedges planted with trees at equal distances, watered with clear and plentiful streams. Rising early the next morning, we arrived at Peggio Imperiale, being a palace of the great duke, not far from the city, having omitted it in my passage to Rome. The ascent to the house is by a stately gallery, as it were of tall and overgrown cypress trees, for near half a mile. At the entrance of these ranges are placed statues of the Tiber and Arno of marble, those also of Virgil, Ovid, Petrarch and Dante. The building is sumptuous and curiously furnished, within with cabinets of Pietra Comessa, in tables, pavements, etc., which is a magnificence or work particularly affected at Florence. The pictures are Adam and Eve by Albert Durer, very excellent, as is that piece of carving in wood by the same hand standing in a cupboard. Here is painted the whole Austrian line, the Duke's mother, sister to the Emperor, the foundress of this palace, than which there is none in Italy that I have seen more magnificently adorned or furnished. Florence. We could not omit in our passage to revisit the same and other curiosities which we had neglected on our first being at Florence. We went therefore to see the famous piece of Andrea del Sarto in the Annunziata. The story is that the painter in a time of dearth borrowed a sack of corn of the religious of that convent, and repayment being demanded, he wrought it out in this picture, which represents Joseph sitting on a sack of corn and reading to the Blessed Virgin, a piece infinitely valued. There fell down in the cloister an old man's face painted on the wall in fresco, 
greatly esteemed and broke into crumbs. The Duke sent his best painters to make another instead of it, but none of them would presume to touch a pencil where Andrea had wrought, like another Apelles. But one of them was so industrious and patient that, picking up the fragments, he laid and fastened them so artificially together that the injury it had received was hardly discernible. Andrea del Sarto lies buried in the same place. Here is also that picture of Bartolomeo, who, having spent his utmost skill in the face of the angel Gabriel, and being troubled that he could not exceed it in the Virgin, he began the body, and to finish the clothes, and so left it, minding in the morning to work on the face. But when he came, no sooner had he drawn away the cloth that was hung before it to preserve it from the dust, than an admirable and ravishing face was found, ready painted. At which miracle all the city came in to worship. It is now kept in the chapel of the Salutation, a place so enriched by devotees that none in Italy save Loreto is said to exceed it. This picture is always covered with three shutters, one of which is of massy silver. Methinks it is very brown, the forehead and cheeks whiter, as if it had been scraped. They report that those who have the honour of seeing it never lose their sight. Happy then we! Belonging to this church is a world of plates, some whole statues of it, and lamps innumerable, besides the costly vows hung up, some of gold and a cabinet of precious stones. Visiting the Duke's repository again, we told at least forty ranks of porphyry and other statues and twenty-eight whole figures, many rare paintings and relievos, two square columns with trophies. In one of the galleries, twenty-four figures and fifty antique heads, a Bacchus of Michelangelo and one of Bandinelli, a head of Bernini and a most lovely Cupid of Parian marble. At the further end, two admirable women sitting and a man fighting with a centaur, three figures in little of Andrea, a huge candlestick of amber, a table of Titian's painting and another representing God the Father sitting in the air on the four evangelists. Animals, diverse smaller pieces of Raphael, a piece of pure virgin gold as big as an egg. In the third chamber of rarities is the square cabinet valued at 80,000 crowns showing on every front a variety of curious work, one of birds and flowers, of Pietro Comessa, one a descent from the cross of Michelangelo, on the third our blessed Saviour and the Apostles of Amber, and on the fourth a crucifix of the same. Between the pictures two naked Venuses by Titian, Adam and Eve by Dura, and several pieces of Port Denoni and Del Frate. There is a globe of six feet diameter. In the armoury were an entire elk, a crocodile, and among the harness several targets and antique horse arms as that of Charles V, two set with turquoises and other precious stones, a horse's tail of a wonderful length. Then, passing the old palace, which has a very great hall for feasts and comedies, the roof rarely painted, and the side walls with six very large pictures representing battles, the works of Giovanni Vasari. Here is a magazine full of plate, a harness of emerald, the furnitures of an altar four feet high and six in length of massy gold. In the middle is placed the statue of Cosmo the Second. The bas relievo is of precious stones, his breeches covered with diamonds. The mouldings of this statue and other ornaments, festoons, etc., are garnished with jewels and great pearls, dedicated to St. Charles, with this inscription in rubies. Cosimo Secundus Dei, Gracia Magnus Dux, Etruriae Ex Voto. There is also a king on horseback, of massy gold, two feet high, and an infinity of such like rarities. Looking at the justice in copper, set up on a column by Cosmo in 1555, after the victory over Siena, we were told that the Duke, asking a gentleman how he liked the piece, he answered that he liked it very well, but that it stood too high for poor men to come at it. 
Prince Leopold has in this city a very excellent collection of paintings, especially a St. Catherine of Paolo Veronese, a Venus of marble, veiled from the middle to the feet, esteemed to be of that Greek workman who made the Venus at the Medici's palace in Rome, altogether as good and better preserved, an inestimable statue, not long since found about Bologna. Signor Gaddi is a lettered person, and has diverse rarities, statues and pictures of the best masters, and one bust of marble as much esteemed as the most antique in Italy, and many curious manuscripts. His best paintings are a Virgin of del Sarto, mentioned by Vasari, a St. John by Raphael, and an Echo Homo by Titian. The hall of the Academy de la Crusca is hung about with impresses and devices painted, all of them relating to corn sifted from the bran. The seats are made like bread baskets and other rustic instruments used about wheat, and the cushions of satin like sacks. We took our farewell of St. Lawrence, more particularly noticing that piece of the Resurrection, which consists of a prodigious number of naked figures, the work of Bontormo. On the left hand is the martyrdom of St. Lawrence by Bronzino, rarely painted indeed. In a chapel is the tomb of Pietro di Medici and his brother John of Copper, excellently designed, standing on two lions' feet, which end in foliage, the work of Michelangelo. Over against this are sepulchres of all the ducal family. The altar has a statue of the Virgin giving suck and two apostles. Paulus Jovius has the honour to be buried in the cloister. Behind the choir is a superb chapel full of Ferdinand I, consisting of eight faces, four plain, four a little hollowed. In the other are to be the sepulchres and a niche of paragon for the statue of the prince now living all of copper gilt. Above is a large table of porphyry for an inscription for the duke in letters of jasper. The whole chapel, walls, pavement and roof are full of precious stones, united with the mouldings which are also of gilded copper, and so are the bases and capitals of the columns. The tabernacle with the whole altar is inlaid with cornelians, lazuli, serpentine, agates, onyxes, etc., on the other side are six very large columns of rock crystal, eight figures of precious stones of several colours, inlaid in natural figures, not inferior to the best paintings, among which are many pearls, diamonds, amethysts, topazes, sumptuous and sparkling beyond description. The windows without side are of white marble. The library is the architecture of Raphael. Before the port is a square vestibule of excellent art, of all the orders, without confusion. The ascent to it from the library is excellent. We numbered 88 shelves, all manuscripts and bound in red, chained, in all about 3,500 volumes, as they told us. The arsenal has sufficient to arm 70,000 men, accurately preserved and kept, with diverse lusty pieces of ordnance, whereof one is for a ball of three hundred pounds weight, and another for a hundred and sixty, which weighs seventy-two thousand five hundred pounds. When I was at Florence, the celebrated masters were for Pietro Comessa, a kind of mosaic or inlaying of varied coloured marble and other more precious stones, Domenico Bonetti and Mazzotti, the best statuary, Vincentio Brocchi, this statuary makes those small figures in plaster and pasteboard, which so resemble copper that, that till one handles them, they cannot be distinguished. He has so rare an art of bronzing them, I bought four of him. The best painter, Pietro Berrettino di Cortona. This duke has a daily tribute for every courtesan or prostitute allowed to practice that infamous trade in his dominions, and so has his holiness the Pope but not so much in value. Bologna Taking leave of our two jolly companions, Signor Giovanni and his fellow, we took horses for Bologna, and by the way alighted at a villa of the Grand Dukes called Pratolino. The house is a square of four pavilions with a fair platform about it, balustrade with stone, situate in a large meadow, ascending like an amphitheatre, 
having at the bottom a huge rock with water running in a small channel like a cascade. On the other side are the gardens. The whole place seems consecrated to pleasure and summer retirement. The inside of the palace may compare with any in Italy for furniture of tapestry, beds, etc., and the gardens are delicious and full of fountains. In the grove sits Pan feeding his flock, the water making a melodious sound through his pipe, and a Hercules whose club yields a shower of water, which falling into a great shell has a naked woman riding on the backs of dolphins. In another grotto is Vulcan and his family, the walls richly composed of coral, shells, copper and marble figures, with the hunting of several beasts moving by the force of water. Here, having been well washed for our curiosity, we went down a large walk at the sides whereof several slender streams of water gush out of pipes concealed underneath that interchangeably fall into each other's channels, making a lofty and perfect arch, so that a man on horseback may ride under it and not receive one drop of wet. This canopy or arch of water I thought one of the most surprising magnificences I had ever seen, and very refreshing in the heat of the summer. At the end of this very long walk stands a woman in white marble, in posture of a lawn dress, wringing water out of a piece of linen, very naturally formed into a vast laver, the work and invention of Michelangelo Buonarroti. Hence we ascended Mount Parnassus, where the muses played to us on hydraulic organs. Near this is a great aviary. All these waters came from the rock in the garden, on which is the statue of a giant representing the Apennines, at the foot of which stands this villa. Last of all we came to the labyrinth, in which a huge coloss of Jupiter throws out a stream over the garden. This is fifty feet in height, having in his body a square chamber, his eyes and mouth serving for windows and door. We took horse and supped that night at Il Ponte, passing a dreadful ridge of the Apennines, in many places capped with snow, which covers them the whole summer. We then descended into a luxurious and rich plain. The next day we passed through Scarperia, mounting the hills again where the passage is so straight and precipitous toward the right hand that we climb them with much care and danger. Lodging at Firenzuolo, which is a fort built among the rocks and defending the confines of the great duke's territories. The next day we pass by the Pietramala, a burning mountain. At the summit of this prodigious mass of hills we had an unpleasant way to Pianura where we slept that night and were entertained with excellent wine. Hence to Scargalazino and to bed at Loeano. This plain begins about six miles from Bologna. Bologna belongs to the Pope and is a famous university, situate in one of the richest spots of Europe for all sorts of provisions. It is built like a ship, whereof the Torre d'Azinelli may go for the main mast. The city is of no great strength, having a trifling wall about it, in circuit near five miles and two in length. This Torre d'Azinelli, ascended by 447 steps of a foot rise, seems exceedingly high, is very narrow, and the more conspicuous from another tower called Garizendi, so artificially built of brick, which increases the wonder, that it seems ready to fall. It is not now so high as the other, but they say the upper part was formerly taken down, for fear it should really fall and do mischief. Next we went to see an imperfect church called St. Pantronius, showing the intent of the founder had he gone on. From this our guide led us to the schools, which are indeed very magnificent thence to St. Dominic's, where that saint's body lies richly enshrined. The stools or seats of this goodly church have the history of the Bible inlaid with several woods, very curiously done, the work of one Fra Damiano di Bergamo, and a friar of that order. Among other relics they show the two books of Esdras, 
written with his own hand. Here lies buried Giacomo Andreas and diverse other learned persons. To the church joins the convent, in the quadrangle whereof are old cypresses said to have been planted by their saint. Then we went to the palace of the legate, a fair brick building, as are most of the houses and buildings, full of excellent carving and mouldings, so as nothing in stone seems to be better finished or more ornamental. Witness those excellent columns to be seen in many of their churches, convents and public buildings, for the whole town is so cloistered that one may pass from house to house through the streets without being exposed either to rain or sun. Before the stately hall of this palace stands the statue of Paul the Fourth, and diverse others, also the monument of the coronation of Charles V. The piazza before it is the most stately in Italy, St Mark's at Venice only excepted. In the centre of it is the fountain of Neptune, a noble figure in copper. Here I saw a Persian walking about in a rich vest of cloth of tissue and several other ornaments, according to the fashion of his country, which much pleased me. He was a young, handsome person of the most stately mien. I would fain have seen the library of St. Saviour, famous for the number of rare manuscripts, but could not. So we went to St. Francis, a glorious pile, and exceedingly adorned within. After dinner I inquired out a priest and Dr. Montalbano, to whom I brought recommendations from Rome. This learned person invented, or found out, the composition of the lapis illuminabilis, or phosphorus. He showed me their property, for he had several, being to retain the light of the sun for some competent time by a kind of imbibition, by a particular way of calcination. Some of these presented a blue colour, like the flame of brimstone, others like coals of a kitchen fire. The rest of the afternoon was taken up in St. Michael in Bosco, built on a steep hill on the edge of the city, for its fabric, pleasant shade and grove, cellars, dormitory and prospects, one of the most delicious retirements I ever saw. Art and nature contending which shall exceed, so as till now I never envied the life of a friar. The whole town and country to a vast extent are under command of their eyes, almost as far as Venice itself. In this convent there are many excellent paintings of Guido Reni, above all the little cloister of eight faces painted by Caracci in fresco. The carvings in wood in the sacristy are admirable, as is the inlaid work about the chapel, which even emulates the best paintings. The work is so delicate and tender. The paintings of the Saviour are of Caracci and Leonardo, and there are excellent things of Raphael, which we could not see. In the church of St. John is a fine piece of San Cecilia by Raphael. As to other paintings, there is in the church of St. Gregory an excellent picture of a bishop giving the habit of St. Bernard to an armed soldier, with several other figures in the piece, the work of Guercino. Indeed, this city is full of rare pieces, especially of Guido Domenico and a virgin named Isabella Sirani, now living, who has painted many excellent pieces and imitates Guido so well that many skilful artists have been deceived. Of the mendicants are the miracles of St. Aloy by Reni, after the manner of Caravaggio, but better, and here they showed us that famous piece of Christ calling St. Matthew by Annibal Caracci. The Marquis Magnani has the whole frieze of his hall painted in fresco by the same hand. Many of the religious men nourish those lapdogs which the ladies are so fond of and which they here sell. They are a pygmy sort of spaniel whose noses they break when puppies, which in my opinion deforms them. At the end of the turning in one of the wings of the dormitory of St. Michael, I found a paper pasted near the window containing the dimensions of most of the famous churches in Italy compared with their towers here and the length of this gallery, a copy whereof I took. From hence, being brought to a subterranean territory of cellars, the courteous friars made us taste a variety of excellent wines, and so we departed to our inn. The city is famous also for sausages, 
and here is sold great quantities of parbeggiano cheese with batago caviare etc which make some of their shops perfume the streets with no agreeable smell we furnish ourselves with wash balls the best being made here and being a considerable commodity this place has also been celebrated for lutes made by the old masters moller and hans fry and nicholas sconvelt which were of extraordinary price the workmen were chiefly germans the cattle used for draught in this country which is very rich and fertile especially in pasturage are covered with housings of linen fringed at the bottom that dangle about them preserving them from flies which in summer are very troublesome ferrara from this pleasant city we proceeded towards ferrara carrying with us a bulletino or bill of health customary on all these parts of italy especially in the state of venice and so put ourselves into a boat that was towed with horses often interrupted by the sluices inventions there to raise the water for the use of mills and to fill the artificial canals at, at each of which we stayed till passage was made we went by the castle bentivoglio and about night arrived at an ugly inn called Malabelgo, belgo agreeable to its name whence after we had supped we embarked and passed that night through the fens where we were so pestered with those flying glow-worms called lucioli that one who had never heard of them would think the country full of sparks of fire beating some of them down and applying them to a book i could read in the dark by the light they afforded quitting our boat we took coach and by morning got to ferrara where before we could gain entrance our guns and arms were taken from us of custom the lock being taken off before as we were advised the city is in a low marshy country and therefore well fortified the houses and streets have nothing of beauty except the palace and church of st benedict where ariosto lies buried and there are some good statues the palazzo del diamante citadel church of san domenico the market-place is very spacious having in its centre the figure of nicolaio olio once duke of ferrara on horseback in copper it is in a word a dirty town and though the streets by large they remain ill-paved yet it is a university and now belongs to the pope though there are not many fine houses in the city the inn where we lodged was a very noble palace having an angel for its sign we parted from hence about three in the afternoon and went some of our way on the canal and then embarked on the po or pardus by the poets called eridanus where they feigned feet to have fallen after his rash attempt and where io was metamorphosed into a cow there was in our company among others a polonian bishop who was exceedingly civil to me in this passage and afterward did me many kindnesses at venice we supped this night at a place called corboa near the ruins of the ancient city adria which gives name to the gulf or sea after three miles having passed thirty on the po we embarked in a stout vessel and through an artificial canal very straight we entered the adige which carried us by break of day into the adriatic and so sailing prosperously by chiosa a town upon an island in this sea and palestina we came over against malamocco the chief port and anchorage where our english merchantmen lie that trade to venice about seven at night after we had stayed at least two hours for permission to land our bill of health being delivered according to custom so soon as we came on shore we were conducted to the Rogana, where our portmanteaus were visited and then we got to our lodging which was at honest signor paolo rodomantes of the black eagle near the rialto one of the best quarters of the town this journey from rome to venice cost me seven pistoles and thirteen julios end of section nineteen